Hello there! I am Zalerla, and this is The Joy of Computer Gaming, where we investigate good, intriguing, and awful examples of computer gaming history. Today I am highlighting honorable mentions for the year of 1983. These are interesting games that I felt did not warrant an entire episode, but still have some things worth pointing out, or at the very least, to complain about. However, before I get to the individual games, I just have to comment on games as a whole from 1984 and beyond. Since trying to do episodes of JCG and concentrating on the very beginning of games I've played and moving forward, I've been ignoring so many other games I really want to talk about. It also doesn't help at this point that it isn't until 1987 when Dungeon Master came out that I played another great game. Sure, there are some good games that came out along the way, like Agent USA, Montezuma's Revenge, or Rescue on Fractalis, but none of these are exceptional great games that I think everybody should play necessarily, unlike Mule. Not only are there so many amazingly awesome games going forward, like Dungeon Master, Captain Blood, Ultima Underworld, XCOM, Unreal Tournament, and Wizardry 8, but there are several wantonly weird and bafflingly bizarre games like New York City the Big Apple, Fublitsky, Drakhen, Castle of Dr. Brain, and Elfish, as well as a slew of astoundingly awful games to talk about, such as Robot Knights, Rings of Zilfin, Mystic Well, WizKid, and Rage of Mages. And I swear I bring up long lists of games like this just to give myself way too much work. Anyways, without further ado... This is Alpman, a rock-climbing platform game created by Thomas Squara and released by Gemini Software. This is the only game I've come across that didn't show up on MobyGames.com at all, and I had to add an entry for it. It starts off with a decent rendition of On Top of Old Smokey for the main menu, then you appear on a rock with vines rising and lowering with a constantly decreasing score. If your score hits zero, you lose. You play the game completely by moving side to side and rock hopping. Reaching the top of the level takes you to the next level. There's water, earthquakes, moving rocks, carts, ski lifts, which you have to move to follow, across 13 levels, many of which are just repeats with marginal changes. Grabbing onto things feels very slippery since the game only seems to test a specific pixel under each of your hands, and you don't move with the vines or carts or whatever else you're holding onto. The last level is very simple, and when you reach the top, a helicopter comes by and picks you up with a horrible voice that tries to say, TRY THE NEXT LEVEL! And then you are moved up a difficulty level. The higher levels have your timer go down way faster, and everything moves faster. This game is quite uninteresting and very frustrating to play. I wouldn't even have mentioned it except for the unique one-off gag when you fall too far. If you do and grab onto a ledge on the way down, your character's arms rip right off and fall down a moment later than the rest of your body. RIP! This is Aztec Challenge, an endless runner game by Robert T. Bonifacio and released by Cosme. The earlier version was included in our last honorable mentions video since it was one of the very first endless runner games. Here it is with far better graphics, but the gameplay hasn't changed much at all. This game has nothing to do with the Commodore 64 game Aztec Challenge, which was made by Paul Norman, but also released by Cosme. Don't ask me how that makes any sense, because I don't have a clue. There are seven level types in increasing difficulty, and your reward for completing all of the levels is to just get to start over again, as level 8 is just a repeat of level 1. Yay. If you complete a level without dying, it gives you an instant replay, which may be the very first instance of such a thing in a video game, but all you can do in this game is small jump, medium jump, or high jump. And for the most part, you just die. And die. And die. You know, I really hate this game. This is BC's Quest for Tires, an endless runner game by Chuck Benton and released by Sierra Online. Wikipedia says the game was created by Rick Banks and Michael Bate, but the Atari 8-bit version says it was programmed by Chuck Benton. In any case, it's based on the comic strip named BC by Johnny Hart, which I know nothing about. But apparently the characters in the game are all taken from the comic. I had to look up what they're named, so I'm sorry if I'm guessing wrong here. There's your character, BC, the fat broad, a dookie bird, the snake, and the cute chick at the end. Those are some, um, really creative character names. This is a more complex Endless Runner than Aztec Challenge, but it is a lot easier. You're always moving, but you can change your speed as well as do a jump or a duck, move forward and move back a bit, and that's how you play through the game. Most of the game is spent dodging obstacles. There are a couple instances where you stop to hop forward and backward over objects bobbing in the water, with the fat broad or the snake at the end, which you have to avoid. There's also a huge pit that you have to speed up to jump successfully. And then there's the part with the dookie bird, which took us a while to figure out back in the day. 
You have to be right under it when the pit comes up and jumps straight up, and it will somehow carry you across. Don't ask how this tiny bird can carry you, or how your wheel sticks to your feet. This isn't a great game by any means, but it was more fun to play through and figure out than a lot of the other simple arcade games at the time. This is Beachhead by Bruce Carver and Kevin Homer, and released by Axis Software. It's an action minigame game where you are leading a convoy into enemy territory to take down an evil dictator. It starts on a large map where you are controlling your fleet. You can choose to go wide and possibly fight the enemy fleet, or you can go through an extremely frustrating bullet hell zone and still probably end up fighting that enemy fleet. Seriously, that bullet hell zone sucks big time on the hardest difficulty, and since you can just skip it, I don't see the point of doing it at all. When you meet up with the enemy fleet, you have two stages, shooting incoming planes and then blasting the enemy ships. Shooting incoming planes is sluggish and annoying, but shooting the enemy ships is outright maddening. You choose the degree of your elevation to fire, it slowly fires, then tells you how far off you are. The enemies just constantly shoot, and every three shots they take out one of your ships. I had to use save state a lot on the hardest difficulty to get through this part because you really have to be accurate to survive. The next minigame is a rather wonky tank simulation where you dodge loads of terrain and have to deal with various enemies. You know, when your shots actually hit them. This is on the hardest difficulty, and I'm sure I made it look easier than it is, but it was definitely not easy. At the end of all of this, you take some shots at white squares on a giant gun emplacement in a similar style to the airplane shooting segment, until you get shot and have to redo the tank sequence again. Until you finally take it out and they surrender. Blark. This is Berserk, a shooter game released by Atari. It originally came out in arcades in 1982. There is no end game, you just go from one room to the next, shooting robots and avoiding the invincible bouncy smiley face. Everything kills you, including the walls, the doors that close behind you, and the slowly exploding robots. The robots also die from everything, so they can bumble into each other or shoot one another, which is marginally helpful. However, if a shot happens to be on the pixel where your non-existent neck should be, it will just pass through you harmlessly. None of this is really all that memorable. What is, is that the game has a robotic sounding voice. When it spoke, it used a different pitch each time as well. If you were in a room too long, you'll hear... And a bouncy head will start chasing you down. If you die, it says... And when you leave a room, it says... If you leave a room while there's still robots in it, it instead says... And when you subsequently die, it changes what it says. Which was amusing to rediscover while recording for this video. Unfortunately, there is nothing about this game other than the silly voices that compels me to play it at all. This is Donkey Kong, released by Nintendo. It's a platform game that originally came out in the arcades in 1981 and was amazingly popular, though I never understood why. I do know the Atari 8-bit release was simpler than the arcade version and had fewer levels, so maybe it was more fun in the actual arcade? You can pick a difficulty, but it's just some game objects, so without experimenting, it's hard to know what those difficulty levels even mean. In the game, you spend most of your time progressing upward, trying to reach the very static woman at the top who occasionally says help, but otherwise doesn't do anything. You have to dodge barrels thrown at you or avoid smiling blue and red flames. There are hammers on the level that prevent you from jumping or climbing ladders, but they can kill enemies if you make certain they hit the head of the hammer. The player character was originally going to be named Jumpman, but was renamed to Mario in the American arcade release as he apparently resembled Nintendo of America's landlord at the time, Mario Sigale. Apparently the woman's name in America is Pauline, though I've never seen that name before. Not that I ever went to the arcades much back then. The problem is that the game gets too repetitious right from the beginning, and dodging the objects is not very fun, especially since there's a bit of randomness to the way they move. I never enjoyed this game and I really don't get why it was so popular. This is Donkey Kong Jr., released by Nintendo. It's a platform game that originally came out in the arcades in 1982. In it, you play Donkey Kong's son against a now evil Mario who has captured your father and put him in a cage. Unlike the original Donkey Kong, in this you have various ropes to climb and objects you can knock down to take out the critters that Mario releases. You have to get keys to pass through the levels. 
I don't know how many types of levels there were in the arcade version, but I could only find two in the Atari 8-bit version. The second one gets pretty crazy with tons of bird things and the chompers from the first level. After you finish it, Donkey Kong gets freed and punts away Mario, and then you get to redo the first level, except it's a lot harder this time around. This game is a little more fun than Donkey Kong and gets really hard, but it's also incredibly frustrating trying to keep track of so many things going on and enemies that move somewhat randomly. This is Droll by Ike Bang and released by Broderbund. It's a side-scrolling shooter with four stages or platforms on each level, where you play a rotund flying robot out to rescue a family of three across three levels. It has a cool, unique intro song and a bright, cartoony look to it. You play by shooting left and right, moving side to side, or jumping slash flying up and down through the four stages. Each level offers distinct challenges and enemies. On the first level, you have to find a flying frog and rescue the little girl. In the way are giant hoppy scorpions and a huge bird you can change into a fried chicken. On the second level, you need to get the flying alligator and get the little boy. There are bouncing boogie monsters and a goblin-like creature that's invincible except when he jumps, and magnets that come after you and block your shots. The third level is by far the most complicated and was actually fun to figure out. There are a ton of weapons being constantly flung at you from the right edge of whichever stage you're on to deal with at random heights, which also move at different rates, making a very random wall of doom heading your way. On the bottom three tiers are hopping snake-like things that are faster than you are. Near the bottom are three ways to get down, but two of them will actually have a plant monster come up to try to catch you. Here, once you rescue the mother, you get a cutscene showing the family together again, except like most games of the time, this takes you to the next difficulty level. On the harder difficulties, little annoying cars are added, and if you fly too long, a little ship will come out and shoot you. Also, sometimes enemies will go into a flicker mode and pop out to shoot at you, which is really annoying. In any case, I rather enjoy playing this game from time to time, especially after figuring out how to deal with the various obstacles. It's fun just shooting down the wall of weapons flying at you, even though I still miss some on occasion and get slaughtered for. This is Gateway to Apshi, created by Epix. It's the first instance of an action RPG that I know of, but other than being played in real time, it's a lot like the older Apshi games. When Diablo came out far later, it reminded me very much of this game, and you can see why. You are playing a character that gets better and better gear found through the dungeon, as well as leveling up from killing monsters. There are doors, secret doors that you have to use the search spell to find, traps galore, and lots of encounters. The monsters range from harmless to ultra-fast and powerful. The controls are strange. You use the joystick to move and use whatever is active at the bottom left, usually fight, but it can be other abilities or items as well. You press select to cycle through commands, option to change what you have equipped, and start to choose to fight or use arrows. The levels are procedurally generated, using the dungeon you chose to enter as a seed. Then you have a time limit you can spend on the level and go around fighting, getting gear, and exploring until your time runs out. You can proceed to the next level anytime you like, but realize everything gets far more powerful when you do. There are many problems in the game that prevented me from enjoying it much when I was younger, and not just the control scheme. It's hard to tell what anything does, you have no idea exactly what your stats or gear do, you have no idea what kind of damage you're taking or dealing, either of which can be zero damage and there's no way to tell. On later levels there are enemies that are way too fast and so on. Would it really have been so hard to just say something like, you take zero damage, you deal three damage, at the bottom right? It was fun to play on occasion back in 1983, but I can't really recommend it to modern gamers. This is Joust, an action game created by Williams Electronics. It originally came out in arcades in 1982. You are supposedly a knight riding a flying stork, I think, jousting with other bird-mounted knights. You win a joust by being higher than whoever you bump into, and if you're both at the same height, you rebound off of each other, causing your birds to chirp. The chirping happens whenever AI birds hit each other, so you'll hear it a lot. You control your bird by pressing left or right and pressing the fire button for each flap of your mount's wings. This game has lots of little extra touches that make it feel like a high-quality product of its time. When you defeat an enemy, their bird flies off screen. When you run on platforms and if you turn around, your bird makes a screeching brake-like sound. Your bird bounces on its belly if you hit a platform at the right angle. The bridges over the lava disappear and eventually fiery hands will reach out of the lava to grab at low-flying birds. Some of the platforms disappear on later waves. There are lots of unique sounds. When you respawn, you choose when you appear so you can wait until it's safe. You end up fighting different colored opponents that fly a little differently. Most waves have a special, such as a survival round, where you get a bonus if you don't die. 
Enemies drop an egg that will hatch into a new bird and night if you don't grab them fast enough. And then there's even the dreaded Terry, which I've only killed once, otherwise it's just death on wings. The problem I have with the game is you're just flapping. I said flapping with an L. Falling on enemies and that's more or less the entire game. I know lots of people really got into this game, but I never really did. This is Mario Brothers by Nintendo and published by Atari. It's a platform game where you bump enemies from below to knock them upside down and then kick them off, as well as collect coins and dodge other obstacles. This is the first game to feature Luigi, with Donkey Kong being the first game featuring Mario. There are various enemies, such as turtles, crabs, which take two hits, and bouncing bugs, which are harder to hit. There are occasionally annoying spinning balls that just kill you if you touch them. There's also a POW that bumps all enemies on the ground at the time once, which regenerates over time after the coin levels. And if you're wondering about the sound, it was a bug with the game on later Ataris. If I switch to an older OS ROM, then play, suddenly it sounds just fine. Until I recorded this video, I'd never heard the correct theme song or these sounds before. Mario Brothers appears as a competitive minigame in Super Mario Brothers 3. In any case, I didn't enjoy this game at all. The sequel, Super Mario Brothers, on the other hand, was brilliant and quite enjoyable, and I'm glad that this wonky game somehow spawned it. This is Mountain King, a unique platform game published by CBS Software. It starts with a decent rendition, at least for the Atari 8-bit, of In the Hollow of the Mountain King from the Pier Gent Suite No. 1 by Edward Grigg, and is the first place I heard the song. While playing, you have to collect what I always thought of as berries, though I think they're supposed to be gems in the cavern walls. You have a flashlight that lets you see the bats flying about and occasionally a hidden treasure chest, worth a lot of points. Once you collect a certain amount of gems, a fire appears somewhere on the level that will occasionally flicker and plays Anitra's Dance, also from Pier Gent. You can highlight it with your flashlight and sit on it and become immolated. Once immolated, you can head to where the crown is, sit on the hidden head below it to make it solid, and use it as a ladder to make your way up to the crown. Once you get the crown, a fast version of the Mountain King music plays, and you have to rush to the top of the level. The bats become visible and can now steal the crown from you. If you make it to the top, you advance to the next difficulty level. There are a lot of other things in the game as well. If you fall a ways, you only slowly get up. If you catch on fire, you can even move a bit before dying, not that it helps you any. In the middle at the bottom is this weird nub thing with the initials RWM next to it, so I had to look it up, and apparently the original game was made by Robert W. Matson. Alright then. I always thought of this as a spider's nest, because if you run on the bottom level a bit, a giant spider comes out and tries to web you. You can get out sometimes, but if you don't, the spider comes back and eats you. You can also choose to play with the ground being hidden, which just seems a bit maddening since they seem rather randomly placed already and it's hard enough to jump on them. It's a strange game, and though unique enough to be memorable, it isn't very fun to play for very long. This is Mr. Robot and His Factory, by Ron Rosen, with music by Gary Gilbertson, released by Datamost. It's a puzzle platform game with a lot of colors, with each white position using a different color so it causes a rainbow effect going down the screen. You need to pick up the pellets in the ground, but there are a number of obstacles along the way, such as flaming enemies, conveyor belts, sliders, bombs, portals, trampolines, and so on. You could pick up a power pellet that gives you a protective field that can take out the flaming enemies, but often you don't get to use them. You have to figure out how to get through the obstacles to complete the levels, sometimes requiring a bit of creativity to figure out how to survive through them. You can only fall a certain distance before dying, unless you land on a trampoline. You also bounce off of the walls. It's a bit reminiscent of Miner 2049er, which came out the year before, with ground you need to convert, sliders, ladders, and so on. And what was it with the old space-themed games making completely random tones? Moon Patrol, which also came out on the Atari 8-bit in the same year, had constant music that just sounded very random. Here, every step you take makes a random tone. For the most part, it's a pretty standard puzzle platform game, and it gets difficult quick. It was fun playing through all of the levels, and yes, dying a lot trying, but what made it stand out for me is that it comes with a level editor. It also has enough stuff so you can make your own Rube Goldberg machines, which I always enjoy making. Here's one I built in a few minutes. This is Pengo, a tile-pushing arcade game released by Atari. It originally came out in the arcade in 1982. You control Pengo the Penguin as he crushes blocks or pushes them to hit... whatever those things are. 
There are three special blocks that are indestructible and give you a bonus if you can get them together, which also stuns the enemies for a few seconds. There are a set number of enemies that'll spawn in certain blocks, and after they're dead, you'll move to the next level. You can also destroy those blocks to kill the enemies within them. And that's it. Seriously, I've explained the entire game. It doesn't get any more interesting than this. In fact, this game was really only included for the sheer simplicity it represents, because this is one of the most boring, uninteresting games I've ever played. I recorded six minutes of video for this, and that was five minutes too much for me. When I played it as a child, it must have been as a form of punishment. That's the only explanation I have. This is Pharaoh's Curse, a platform shooter game by Steve Coleman and released by Synapse Software. It's a rather unique game where you traverse 16 rooms to grab treasures, which includes the title screen. In fact, to win, you need to gather every treasure, then make your way back to the title screen, where you'll continue your adventure on the next level, which is essentially the same but harder by having enemies attack more often, traps set off faster, and such. In the way are a mummy and a pharaoh who will randomly appear and try to shoot you. Yeah, that doesn't make much sense. A bird that will whisk you away to another room, various traps and obstacles, locked doors, and an occasional crown or arrow of death that spawns quite regularly at times. As a kid, this game was tons of fun to play because it was really quirky and you had to learn the best ways to deal with various rooms. I could see the figuring out how to do all the rooms bit being fun at first. Many of them take a bit of experimentation, such as this room where you need to learn the right timing to be able to get picked up by the rising bat thing in the middle. The problem, though this is part of its odd charm, is how random some things are and how quirky the game itself is. Whenever Pharaoh or the mummy spawn or not is random. They can camp lower ground you may need to get to and will shoot you before you can react since you can't fire while you're falling. The ground traps occur after a random amount of time and many are tied to each other, making some rooms like this one particularly deadly. You move quickly, so timing jumps is difficult. You or the enemies can even go through the ground or walls on occasion. Your score value can get messed up, I mean what digit does a crown even represent? Keys are used even if you've already opened doors, and so on. Anyways, it's a fun, weird little game for a short while. This is Rally Speedway, a time trial racing game by John Anderson and released by Adventure International. It gives you a lot of options for controlling how your race goes right off, and while you're racing it keeps track of your best lap time. It will make a lower sound when your best time is reached and a higher sound when you complete a lap. If you run into any trees or buildings in the terrain, your car explodes into flames and your character rolls the fire off themselves, well, if they're a flame. This only penalizes you by adding 5 seconds to your time, though you start from a standstill so the acceleration time adds up as well. One interesting selection is only on a computer, which is a no-clipping mode that lets you drive through everything. Crank up the speed with this on and you can see some wild slides when you take turns too late, aside from doing other shenanigans. What is particularly notable about the game is that it came with a track editor. The track is wraparound so you can make some impossible tracks with it, and in fact the game comes with levels that do that. The game also doesn't test that the pieces match at all so you can put some weird tiles together in ways that they wouldn't work. It was fun as a kid just playing around with this and making goofy tracks. The real issue is that this is all there is to the game. No challenges or much to do except go on time trials. There's no AI to compete with or score other than the time it took to do your trial. This is Shamus Case 2, a platform shooter game by William Mataga and published by Synapse Software. I had never played the first game, so I grabbed it to try it out as well. The first game is a lot like Berserk, complete with an invincible enemy that shows up if you take too long, but it has set rooms and items you can pick up. It's mostly nothing like Shamus Case 2, except that there are loads of enemies in it. Back to Shamus Case 2. There are platform bits where you slide up and down ladders and deal with snakes, single jumping rooms, and then the not quite breakout rooms. Holy moly, the amount of stuff this game throws at you all at once. Look no further than this to see the one Atari 8-bit game with the most simultaneous on-screen sprites. Though your shots just tear through their ranks with ease at least. If the enemies all hit the floors under you, you'll fall a floor or three. And occasionally you get a giant bird that drops shots at you that you can turn into a giant ball of destruction. This game is hard because of the sliding movement on the ladders, the frustrating jumping bits, and the droves of monsters you have to fight through. You go up until you set explosives at the top of the building and then have to run all the way down to the bottom to blow it up. Then you get to do it all over again on a harder difficulty. 
Unfortunately, this is pretty much all there is to the game, and for me, none of it was fun to play. This is SS Achilles, a really strange arcade game by David Munzer and Simon Goodwin, released by Beyond Software. I didn't remember its name for the longest time, but I finally found it after all these years because I remembered you were a ship, on a ship, getting stuff for a ship, with integrity for health, and there was a fungus spreading out there to destroy you. And playing it again after finally finding it again, that's about all there is to it, aside from the really annoying control scheme. You collect relics, which look like eggs, integrity packs, and power modules. Take these back to the shuttle, the integrity packs and power modules heal you. I think you need to get all 20 relics to win, though I haven't been able to. There are sealant guns that give you a brief power to seal doors so the fungus takes longer to break through them. And a timer that, when it runs out, spawns another fungus. There are annoying scavengers that just hurt you, you take damage from walls, and then there's the fungus which grows really quickly when it gets through the doorways and eats your health really fast. The map is always the same. The items switch around a bit, and where the fungus spawns seems to be random amongst a list of set locations around the map. The controls are using the joystick to move, with the button to move faster, but you burn power faster. Start to activate the sealant. S on a scanner to use it, and M to return back to the game, and space to pause. It's a little weird. The game does have five difficulties, which just make everything worse. At the low end, your sealant guns last a while, there's only a single scavenger, and it takes five minutes for each new fungus. At the hardest difficulty, there are lots of scavengers, only two and a half minutes between each fungus, and the sealant guns last about half a second. This is TGIF by Avalon Hill. It's like a simple card game played on a computer with random events galore. You set a score for the goal of the game, then you take turns with a spinner choosing which day of the week you get to experience or investment. Each choice has options for what might happen during the day, and for anybody that doesn't know, TGIF stands for Thank God It's Friday. Mondays are taxes and expenses. Tuesdays are lottery drawings. You can buy up to three tickets between turns. Wednesdays are windfalls where you get more money. Man, I wish Wednesdays were like that. Thursdays are random. I think it chooses out of all the options for other days. Fridays are payday, and sometimes we'll offer an investment. Saturdays are treasure hunts, which give a random number of digs and you have to find the spot with the treasure before you run out. This is where most of your money comes from. Sundays are just lazy days where you usually don't do anything, though sometimes you can sell investments. And investments let you buy or sell cars, houses, and land. And that's pretty much the game until someone wins! It's all very random what you get out of everything, or what you even get. Aside from the treasure hunt, or the rare decision, there isn't much game to even play. Still, I remember enjoying this game quite a lot as a kid, when we'd all play together with my mother to try to see who could reach the goal the fastest. It's alright as a roll-a-thon game or to play with young children, since a full game normally takes about only 15 minutes or so. This is Two Tank Ham by Konami, published by Parker Brothers. It originally came out in the arcades in 1982, and I know absolutely nothing about the arcade version, just the Atari 8-bit version. This game is simply awful. With its annoying high-pitched sounds, enemies that move completely randomly and way too fast, the sliding movement, the lane shooting you can only do side to side, big open dull areas, there being only four levels that just repeat, and so on. Even as a kid, I just didn't get this game at all. Even with all the problems I mentioned, you can get through all four levels on your first playthrough or two because it's so simplistic and the enemies are so random. Also, I encountered a pretty severe bug when I started on level 3. On my first death, it was already game over. So I switched to level 4, but whenever I died, I switched back to level 3, then back to level 4 after dying again, and not losing a life. <sighs> so to my horror, this game comes to mind every now and then to haunt me. 
along with the likes of Robot Knights, Monty Python's Flying Circus, and the utterly mindless WizKid. I sometimes wish I could erase these games from existence, or at least from my memory, so I wouldn't have to think about them and finally be free of the torment that was forcing myself through these games. When you can look at a game and honestly say, yeah, Rage of Mages was better, or I'd rather play another round of Zeppelin, you know you have something truly special. In short, I detest this game. Speaking of Zeppelin, this is Zeppelin by William Mataga and released by Synapse Software, just like Shamus Case 2, which we discussed earlier. It's a scrolling, not bullet hell, more like an obstacle hell, where you need to shoot things like crazy because there's so much stuff in the way. You can aim one shot, while a second shot always fires in the direction the screen is moving. There are so many things on the screen to shoot, dodge, or otherwise deal with. In some areas, the screen shakes constantly, making it even harder to get through the area, especially since the positions of the obstacles don't count as moving, so you can hit things even when it looks like you shouldn't have. There are often multiple paths you can take, and you do get a moment of invincibility after you die, but that doesn't stop the madness that sets in as you die, and die, and die. This is easily one of the hardest games I've ever played, and it isn't really enjoyable at all, unless you're a masochist that loves playing difficult games merely for the sake of difficulty, in which case perhaps you'll enjoy this game. Otherwise, avoid it to keep from losing yet another shard of your already fractured sanity.